Hello again, my friends. You have tuned in to lecture 3.3 entitled Mammalian Modes of Feeding. So mammals, like all organisms, are going to require energy and nutrients for maintenance, growth, reproduction, or survival. So maintaining a high body temperature, as we know, is a key feature of the class mammalia. And so it's going to require the regular acquisition of food. Today I will be discussing an array of different strategies that mammals employ to meet their nutritional demands, to survive and reproduce, beginning with insectivory, as exhibited by this pygmy marmoset. We'll discuss carnivory, um, as shown here by this mountain lion herbivory and uh, its many different forms uh, demonstrated here by the saiga antelope uh, as well as frugivory uh, exhibited here by this adorable uh, nocturnal kinkajou as well as a whole variety of other strategies. So I'll also focus on the anatomical adaptations in skull structure and jaw musculature, uh, a quick review of dentition, as well as the digestive tracts that support each one of these different modes of feeding. This lecture is going to align with chapter seven in your textbook, which is entitled Modes of Feeding. A quick note, you are only responsible for the first part of chapter seven, which is entitled Foods and Feeding. On your next assessment, you will not be responsible for the second part of chapter seven, which is entitled Foraging Strategies. As I'm sure you recall from module one, we only understand the life history traits the food habits of both extant and extinct mammals by examining their teeth. Dentition is just so important in the science of mammalogy because as mammals evolved during the Mesozoic, major changes occurred in their dentition and jaw musculature. Teeth became differentiated to perform specialized functions. Think canines and incisors and molars. So within extant species, several trophic groups can be recognized. And by this I mean the insectivores, the carnivores, the herbivores, and the omnivores. There are other specialized modes of feeding as well that have evolved from these four basic plans. On the bottom left, for example, uh, we have the huge tusks shown by the mollusk-eating walrus. Uh, here, the, uh, this is the baleen um, that's shown by the mysticetes, the filter feeding whales. Here's the piscivorous or fish eating uh, dolphin skull. We have nectivorous and frugivorous uh, bats. The other concept that this figure, which is 7.1 in your book, does a really nice job illustrating is it shows the increased specialization within each of these trophic guilds. So for example, if we look at the insectivores, uh, here's the basic insectivore plan, um, but you can see as we move across these species, they become increasingly more specialized. At the top here is the giant anteater. It has no teeth. It's exchanged its teeth for this incredibly long, sticky tongue. The same thing is demonstrated here in the carnivores. So uh, here's an omnivorous uh, raccoon here, a canid, and at the top here we have the felids. They're of course the most carnivorous of the carnivores. They have the greatest reliance on meat. And as such, we can see this reflected in their skull structure and their dentition. You remember when I showed you that bobcat skull, uh, this is lower jaw 
saw here is a lever. They have this compressed rostrum here compared to the canids and the ursids, and that's going to place that biting force much closer to the fulcrum. Uh, it's going to give them a much more powerful bite, so increased specialization for carnivory. Mammals that consume insects and other small arthropods, uh, like uh, monarch butterflies here, you know, arachnids, centipedes, isopods, as well as segmented and round worms, are all referred to as insectivorous mammals, meaning insect eating. You will recall from module one that the fossil morphology and dentition from the late Triassic, early Jurassic mammals, like the 160 million year old Jeremiah, indicate that the insectivorous feeding niche represents the primitive or basal condition of eutherian mammals. Today, insectivory is exploited by members from nine mammalian orders, including the spiny echidnas and the duck-billed platypus here on the top left. You will recall that's the order monotremata. Also remember that mammals that eat worms are lumped in with the insectivores. Top middle here are the marsupial moles. Hopefully you remember them as well. Uh, clearly insectivorous as we snarf down this giant centipede. The order is Nodorictomorphia. The Eulopotifola, that includes the hedgehogs, shrews, moles, and desmonds. This is a shrew here on the top right. There are lots of insectivorous bats. Bats are the order Chiroptera. In the middle here, this is that giant anteater. I showed you the skull on the last slide. The order is Singulata. Here are the armadillos, the order Pelosa, and we are covering both of these orders, the Singulata and the Pelosa, in our next lecture. On the bottom left here, we have a pangolin. You can see him ripping up the log there, trying to get at insects. Pangolins are in the order Folodota. Everybody remembers the earth pig, uh, our favorite, the aardvark here, which of course is the order tubulo edentata. And then surprisingly, um, there is an insectivorous carnivore. This is the ard wolf on the bottom right, which is another termite specialist. You can see that long sticky tongue on the ard wolf with all of those little uh, papillae protrusions. The dentition of insectivorous mammals like shrews, moles, hedgehogs here on the bottom left, insectivorous bats on the bottom right. Insectivore dentition is characterized by numerous sharp teeth with very sharp cones as exhibited here by the hedgehog as well as blade-like teeth uh, as shown here by the insectivorous bat. These sharp blade-like teeth are for piercing and shearing and then ultimately crunching up the tough chitinous exoskeletons that surround insects and other arthropods. We also observe in insectivores that the lower incisors here are slightly procumbent meaning they're going to point forward and upward just a bit in order to grasp that insect prey that's trying to fly or hop away very quickly. As insectivorous mammals consume minimal amounts of fibrous vegetation, they don't eat a lot of plants containing really difficult to digest cellulose, which we'll talk about when we talk about uh, the herbivores. The insectivores don't have to have uh, any prolonged fermentation, and therefore their digestive tracts are relatively short and simple. 
So insectivores and chiropterans, the bats, they're going to lack a cecum. Recall the cecum is this pouch uh, that's at the junction of the small and the large intestines. We're going to see cecum in these other trophic guilds. Insectivores lack a cecum. So this is figure 7.2 in your textbook, uh, which I'll be returning to uh, multiple times throughout this lecture. So make sure you know this uh, figure here with the representative digestive tracts. Um, it's a really good one to know for your next assessment. Wink, wink. So let's begin our survey with the aerial insectivores. Given that the most abundant foods on planet Earth are plants and insects, it's not surprising that the most abundant mammals are rodents, which are most often herbivorous, and our focus now, the bats, which the majority of are insectivorous. In fact, 70% of the microchiropterans, which excludes the megachiroptera, which are the large fruit bats or the flying foxes. So 70% of the microchiropterans are insectivorous. Chiropterans are going to occupy ecological niches in almost all habitats of the world. Their diversity of diets is simply unparalleled among extant mammals. As we'll see in this lecture, uh, bats can also feed on fruit, blood, fish, frogs, birds, you name it, and there is a species of bat that eats it. However, all bats residing north of 38 degrees latitude, which is in like southern Illinois, all bats from southern Illinois north, as well as all bats from 40 degrees latitude south, which is like southern Chile and Argentina. So bats in these uh, temperate regions, um, they are all insectivorous. Okay, So the frugivorous bats, they're going to be in warmer tropical weather. We're going to cover bats in module six, but for now, recognize that bats have very high metabolic rates and astoundingly may consume 50% of their body mass in insects each night. Imagine consuming 50% of your body mass in food stuff daily. Insectivorous bats are voracious eaters. Mexican free-tailed bats in central Texas, totaling some 20 million individuals, may consume up to a quarter of a million pounds of insects nightly and fly as high as 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters in search of their prey. So this picture uh, I purposefully had to put in, it really brings back some memories. This is the Congress Avenue Bridge spanning Lady Bird Lake in downtown Austin, Texas. So during the summer, this bridge is home to over 1.5 million Mexican free-tailed bats. So I was actually born in Austin, and this bridge, this is where I did my very first wildlife field work way back in 1995. So as a freshman biology student at the University of Texas, I was trying to assess temperature and humidity differences between the channels under the bridge where the bats roost and compare those to ambient temperatures, trying to understand why uh, bats select the sites that they do for roosting. 
So I had to wade through like knee deep guano, uh, really ripe, uh, ammonia rich bat droppings, uh, to get up under, uh, the edges of the bridge and record measurements. So, but I have to say, if you ever visit Austin between like late March and early fall, it is quite a spectacle to sit out with the crowds right at sunset and just watch these bats stream out into the sky by the tens of thousands. It's awesome. So did you know that you can check out urban Mexican free-tailed bats living right here in Phoenix? So every year between May and October, approximately 10 to 20,000 bats flock to Phoenix uh, on their migration uh, to Mexico. During the day, they're going to gather within a cave to rest, which is actually a flood control tunnel. So to get to the tunnel, you're going to walk north west from 40th Street and Camelback on the northernmost end of the Arizona Canal Trail. So if you just Google um, uh, Bat Cave uh, on Google Maps, it'll show you uh, the location and the parking for the Bat Cave. Um, for now, I want you to check out uh, this very short video that's embedded in Canvas. Um, it's produced by Arizona Game and Fish and it will show you uh, the bat cave. So check it out and uh, maybe later this spring uh, go and check out our urban Mexican free-tailed bats. As I previously mentioned, there are many terrestrial insectivores. Uh, but for now, I really want to hone in on three really unique species of shrew and then the uh, Hispanolan selenodon, as these four species of mammal produce venomous saliva. In fact, the toxin of the North American northern short-tailed shrew, which is pictured here at left, was purified and characterized as a lethal mammalian venom capable of breaking down proteins like the enzyme protease. The toxin is administered to the shrew's prey through a concave medial surface in the first lower incisors. So extracts of this toxin administered to mice affected the nervous, respiratory, and vascular systems causing irregular respiration, paralysis, convulsions, followed by death. So this is a very toxic venom that is in the saliva of the northern short-tailed shrew. So the shrew is going to bite its prey, which the venom immobilizes it, and then it's going to cache its prey underground in a comatose state to then feed on it when it needs it. So there is a special uh, case study blurb in your book about the ability of the water shrew to smell while hunting underwater. It's blowing air out of its nose. <clears throat> the little section is called underwater sniffing. Uh, but for now, I would love for you to take the one minute and 42 seconds here and check out David Attenborough and this amazing footage of a water shrew hunting underwater. It's after aquatic dragonfly larva. A special case of insectivory is called myrrh macophagy. It's mammals that are going to specialize on colonial ants and termites. So these ant eaters include armadillos, the silky ant eater, which is pictured here on the left, the giant ant eater, and again, we'll be covering the ant eaters and the armadillos in our next lecture, 3.4 as well as the pangolin, the aardvark, and you remember the numbat from our lecture on marsupials. 
So a reduction in teeth is common among myrmecophagous insectivores. Their dentition is going to depart from the general insectivorous mold. We're going to have peg-like teeth, like we see in the armadillos, or no teeth at all, like in the echidnas, the anteaters, and the pangolins. And before we move on, notice those really stout, strong claws for digging and breaking open uh, those ant mounds. Perhaps most impressive about the mere macophagus insectivores is the their long and extendable worm-like tongues. So the tongue of the giant anteater can be three times the length of its skull. It's actually anchored, the tongue is anchored way down here in the sternum. So the sternum, right, that connects the rib cage. Um, you can see the tongue is running all the way down here, right? So that's how it can be three times longer than the skull. Further, the giant anteater has got these greatly enlarged salivary glands situated in the neck that are going to produce this viscous, sticky secretion that coats the tongue and allows it to grab hold of the ants and the termites. It's also very important because it begins to break down the chitin. The chitin is that sugar, um, that long carbon chain that's going to make up the arthropod exoskeleton. All in all, these tongues are highly maneuverable and very sticky to effectively reach down into the inner recesses of ant and termite nests. Long, extendable tongues aren't the only way to reach deep into the recesses where insects like to hide. The third finger on the eye eye from Madagascar and the fourth finger here uh, on the striped possum or the trioc from Australasia both of these species, these fingers are uniquely adapted as probes, right? To get at insects from crevices within trees. So using this keen sense of hearing, the eye eye can detect larval insects hidden under the bark of trees. It's then going to expose them by gnawing off the outer layer of bark with its incisors. And then it's going to insert that third finger in to crush and extract that larva. So really cool adaptations uh, for these insectivores. Carnivorous mammals feed primarily on other animals. Members of this group comprise the flesh-eating members of the order Carnivora, including the felids, the hyenas, the canids, the mustelids, that's the weasel family like you see right here, uh, the mongoose, as well as the fossa uh, from Madagascar. Uh, and then let us not forget our carnivorous dazzy urid marsupials. Uh, of course, the thylacine is extinct, but it was definitely carnivorous. The largest carnivorous marsupial is the Tasmanian devil. You remember that? And then the carnivorous tiger quoll here. We learned about those guys in module two. Important to mention now, however, the order Carnivora okay, is actually represented by a diverse array of feeding types and dental morphologies, ranging from obligatory meat eaters with large carnassial teeth, uh, like the cats and the hyenas, to more omnivorous species, uh, like the grizzly bear, 
all the way to, you know, giant pandas, which are folivorous. They're herbivorous uh, animals that specialize on the shoots of bamboo. Um, they have crushing molars and they're not eating any meat at all. So a wide variety of feeding strategies in the order carnivora. Returning to figure 7.2. Animal material, eating meat, is mostly protein. And protein is converted to energy much more efficiently, much easier than plant material is. So like the insectivores, the carnivore alimentary canal is going to be relatively short and simple and the cecum if they have one is quite small most carnivores are predators that are typified by strong skulls with powerful jaws and sharp canines that have evolved to kill their prey so that said, the different apex predators have different killing strategies. This is actually something that I thought quite a bit about. Um, as a young man in the early 2000s, I spent three years putting mortality sensing radio collars on neonatal elk, that is to say newborn calf elk. And I was trying to determine predation rates on these calves from the newly recolonizing gray wolves, as well as grizzly and black bears, mountain lions, and coyotes. One of the things that I quickly learned is that these different apex predators have very different strategies for killing the calves. And then they also have different consumption patterns. They're going to eat different things. So my teams and I got very good um, at reading a mortality site and necropsying uh, the remains of calf elk to determine uh, who done it. Um, I'm going to return to this research and present it to you as a case study in module seven. But for now, I want you to recognize uh, that the felids, particularly the large cats, they're typically going to uh, kill their prey with a single penetrating bite. And it's often at the base of the skull, like you see this cheetah here, uh, uh, biting this Thompson's gazelle and the canine is going to go into the vertebral column and it's going to sever or pierce that spinal cord. The other place that the large cats will often bite is in the throat. So they'll crush the trachea or the windpipe and suffocate their prey. Whereas the hyenas, the African wild dogs, they're going to kill uh, with several shallower bites. It was the same way in Montana. So the packs of wolves um, or coyotes, they would just rip those elk calves up and we would find scattered uh, bits and pieces of elk calf all over the place um, because you know different pack mates would rip off a hunk of meat and then move away uh, to feed. So once the prey is subdued, carnivores rely on st long, strong, pointed teeth to tear and shear the flesh into hunks, which are then swallowed, really, without being finely divided, masticated uh, in the mouth. Most carnivores do have a pair of carnassial teeth, which we've discussed, that provide that shearing mechanism when the mouth is closed. So as you would predict, based on their diets, the carnassials are most highly developed in the felids and the canids, and least developed in the more omnivorous carnivores like the ursids, the bears, and the raccoons. Uh, because they have large crushing molars in addition to their carnassials, dogs are going to be able to crush bones, whereas cats cannot. So in Montana, we learned that the mountain lions are very 
picky about what they eat. They will eat the elk calf's liver, the kidneys, maybe some heart, maybe a bit of muscle meat, but they're going to reject the rumen and the intestines. Um, instead, they're just going to go move, move on, and kill again. This is figure 7.8 in your textbook. It's a comparison of the jaw mechanics of a carnivore on the left, a a hyena and an herbivore, uh, a legomorph, a hare on the right. So what I want you to note is the carnivore has this very large temporalis muscle and a moderately sized masseter muscle which attaches to the coronoid process in the jaw. So what this large musculature is going to do is it's going to allow that carnivore to have an up and down powerful chomping motion. Meanwhile, the herbivore has a decent sized masseter muscle, but a very small temporalis muscle. So the herbivore, its lower jaw is going to move side to side as it bites. And then down in the lower part of the figure, we have the occlusal surfaces of teeth. On the left, we have the carnassials of a carnivore for shearing meat. In the middle, uh, we have the rolling and crushing of brittle foods by um, an omnivore's uh, bunodont uh, teeth here. And then we have hypsodont teeth on the far right for shredding and grinding tough fibrous material. These are like the cheek teeth of an ungulate, like a horse. This is astounding footage of a jaguar killing a massive caiman. Um, it's just amazing. So it puts the stalk on the caiman and then it jumps and it kills with a single powerful bite to the base of the skull. And it's crazy because if you watch it closely, you can see the moment that the spinal cord is severed because the crocodilian is just like thrashing about and then it just goes limp right? Um, so really amazing footage. Uh, spend the two minutes and uh, check out this amazing predation scene. Next we're going to take a quick survey of the terrestrial carnivores and we'll start with the family the Mustelidae. So this is the weasel family. It's going to include species like the wolverine, the pine marten, and the fisher. This is a long-tailed weasel here, and it's killed a vole. It does this by rapidly biting at the base of the skull or just by ripping out the jugular. So it's kind of similar to the way felids kill. The long-tailed weasel is going to consume first the brain of the vole, and then its heart, its lungs, and then ultimately the entire body, uh, bones, fur, and all. The felids, like this snow leopard leaping after this mountain goat and her calf, are highly adapted for capturing and consuming vertebrate prey. Their senses of smell and hearing are quite acute. Their eyes are larger than in most vertebrates and they face forward, providing binocular vision, uh, a depth perception, which is going to allow them to locate their prey and capture it. They also have long, retractable claws that serve as effective meat hooks for capturing, slashing, and immobilizing their prey. Uh, one of the things we would always look for on the elk calf mortality scenes is if we had tracks, uh, wolf tracks, the canid tracks, as well as the bear tracks are going to show claws, whereas mountain lion tracks very, very rarely show claws as they are retractable. 
The Canaans, like these African wild dogs, are opportunistic hunters. They're going to rely on high intelligence, social organization, and superb behavioral adaptability. As discussed when we covered the benefits of living in groups, uh, large canines like gray wolves and these African wild dogs, they're going to hunt in packs, sometimes of up to 30 members, and that's going to allow them to seek out and kill uh, prey considerably larger and potentially more dangerous. As discussed, Although most chiropterans are going to feed on insects taken on the wing, there are certain species of carnivorous bats that are quite specialized for feeding on small vertebrates such as rodents, birds, frogs, uh, lizards, small fish, and even other bats. So the frog-eating bat, obviously shown here, consumes small vertebrates such as frogs and lizards and is able to locate and distinguish between different species of frogs by listening for and analyzing their unique calls. This is really important because it's going to allow for these carnivorous frog-eating bats to discriminate between poisonous and palatable frog species. Which brings us to the sanguinivorous vampire bats. That is to say, the blood-feeding bats. There are three species that consume blood. All are confined to the New World from Mexico down to northern Argentina. The common vampire bat, which is pictured here, is going to prey exclusively on other mammals. Whereas the other two species, the white-winged and hairy-legged vampire bats, prefer avian prey. When found near human settlements, these bats, these common vampire bats, will ingest blood from cattle, horses, mules, pigs, sheep, goats, clearly, um, and even humans. The skull of the vampire bat is modified accordingly. It has these blade-like upper incisors and canines. And then it has a long and highly vascularized stomach uh, shown here, which is actually going to serve to store large amounts of blood and absorb water from the blood, concentrating it here before passing that concentrated blood into the small intestine. So that's different um, than a stomach that's going to digest protein uh, with the enzyme protease uh, as occurs in most mammals. So predators that eat fish are called piscivorous, meaning fish eating. At least three species of bats are known to capture and eat fish. The greater bulldog bat, which is the species uh, pictured here in this beautiful shot. Um, there's the fish-eating bat, which is in the genus Myotis, and the large-footed bat in the same genus. So bulldog bats are going to employ echolocation to detect ripples in the water caused by the fish swimming near the water's surface. They skim low, dragging their feet along the surface of the water uh, with their limbs uh, and hook-like claws rotated forward, which act as a gaff a fishing spear to gaff their prey. So fish uh, can be taken that are up to eight centimeters in length, which is about three inches. And these bulldog, greater bulldog bats, may capture 30 to 40 of these fish per night. Next, we'll very quickly survey the aquatic carnivores, and we'll start with a very special case of carnivory, the baleen whales, named because of this structure right here, this feeding apparatus, uh, the long, wispy, uh, hair-like structure. This is a baleen.
So the baleen whales collectively are known as the mysticetes, and they are going to use their baleens to strain small microscopic organisms out of the water. Uh, things like krill. Collectively, all of these microorganisms are, are deemed plankton. Plankton is just Greek for to wander. But the baleen is uh, situated here at the front of the mouth, and it is going to serve as a sieve uh, to grab hold of those plankton. We're going to cover the cetaceans in much greater detail in Module 7. But before moving on, it's important to note that the mysticetes are not just eating plankton. So this is some pretty astounding footage of humpback whales that are hunting cooperatively. So one large female will get down below her pod mates and she's going to blow these bubble nets, which are going to create these walls of bubbles and ensnare entire schools of herrings, concentrating them in one spot, which is going to allow for her pod mates then uh, to snarf up huge huge mouthfuls of herring. Uh, so check this out embedded in canvas from BBC Earth. The toothed whales, porpoises and dolphins, are collectively known as the odontocetes, the toothed whales, and they are fish and squid specialists. So they're piscivorous. They have numerous small, sharp, simple teeth. Remember, they have homodont dentition. Your dolphins have homodont dentition. And it's to optimize prey capture. So the mouth of a porpoise or a dolphin essentially forms a fish trap similar to that used by other fish-eating vertebrates, such as gars, which is that type of fish with the long snouts and um, the uh, teeth, uh, very similar teeth, uh, crocodiles, as well as mergansers, if you've ever seen uh, mergansers, which is a type of diving waterfowl with a serrated bill. The adaptive value of this morphology is quite clear. Fish are active and slippery, and they must be trapped and swallowed quickly to prevent their escape. As in the odontocetes, the jaws and teeth of the pinnipeds, which are the seals and sea lions, are adapted for grasping prey, ripping it up so that they can swallow uh, the fish whole or enlarge chunks as seen here by this sea lion swallowing a large hunk of salmon. Herbivorous mammals like this cape buffalo consume green plants and thus they constitute the base of the consumer food web. They are the primary consumers, the herbivores. So plant food is going to be far more abundant than animal food, but its energy content is much, much lower. Gaining access to the protein that's locked within the leaves and stems is quite difficult due to the tough, fibrous cell walls found in plants. We can divide the herbivores up into two main groups. Number one, the browsers and the grazers, such as the hoofed mammals, like the perissodactyla, the odd-toed ungulates, like the three-toed rhino here on the top left, and the set artiodactyla, which are the even-toed ungulates, like this four-toed caribou here on the top right, although they only walk on two toes. Uh, number two, uh, the gnars. So the rodentia, like these capybara here on the bottom left, and the legomorpha, like the cottontail rabbit. It is worth noting, though, that there are other important herbivores like kangaroos and wallabies and wombats, we know that, langurs, sloths, elephants and hyraxes, as well as aquatic grazers like the manatees and dugong. 
Herbivores feed on a great diversity of foods, including grasses, leaves, fruit, seeds, nectar, pollen, and even the sap and the resins and the gums of plants and trees. I'm going to quickly survey examples of each, but first, on the Serengeti Plains of East Africa, we see dense migrating herds of ungulates that are going to influence plant community succession and they're going to finally partition the available resources. This specialization is going to minimize competition and it's going to allow for this incredible diversity of sympatric herbivores, herbivores living in the same community. These herbivores are going to respond to the growth of grasses in a predictable sequence. So first, uh, the perissodactyls, such as the plains zebra here, are going to enter long grass communities on the plains and consume many of those longer stem grasses. Next are going to come the incredibly massive herds of wildebeest. They're going to trample and graze those grasses way down uh, to short heights. The last invasion of ungulates is that of the Thompson's gazelles, which feed on short grass during the dry season. In addition to the different spatial and temporal division of resources, these ungulates sort out available food according to different parts of plants. So giraffes, pictured here are obviously feeding on leaves from the tops of the trees. That's their niche. Zebras consume mostly stems and sheaths of grass. They hardly eat any leaves. The wildebeest are also going to eat great numbers of sheaths, but also leaves. And gazelles eat grass, sheaths, and herbs not consumed by these other two species. In general, herbivores are typified by skulls in which the canines are reduced or completely absent, as well as broad molars that are adapted for crushing, shredding, and grinding fibrous plant tissue. As you recall, the rodents are characterized by a single pair of ever-growing chisel-like incisors on both the upper and the lower jaws. The legomorphs have an additional secondary pair of upper incisors right here that are located immediately behind the first pair. Because those canine teeth are absent, there's this wide gap here called the diastema that occurs between the incisors and the cheek teeth. Again, herbivores have a large masseter muscle connected to their lower jaw and a very small temporalis muscle. So this large masseter muscle is going to allow that lower jaw to move side to side to grind up those fibrous plants. So mammals do not produce cellulose splitting enzymes. So they have to rely on microorganisms residing in their alimentary canals. These microorganisms are the ones that are going to break down and metabolize the cellulose of plants and then release fatty acids and sugars that can be absorbed by their herbivorous mammalian hosts. Rodents and legomorphs, like this jackrabbit, are called non-ruminant herbivores. So they become inoculated with the appropriate anaerobic protozoans and bacteria by eating uh, maternal feces in a, in a process called coprophagy, which we'll come to here in just a second. Ungulates have evolved two different systems for breaking down cellulose foregut fermentation, also called rumination. These are the ruminant 
uh, herbivores. It's named for this structure here, the rumen, which is this massive chamber that's just teeming with microorganisms. And then the second strategy is called hindgut fermentation, uh, like we see here in the rabbits, in which case there is no rumen. So young ungulates commonly consume soil to acquire their microorganisms. Let's begin with those herbivores uh, that have a rumen. So they do four gut fermentation, meaning the fermentation of the plant material by microbes occurs at the beginning of the alimentary canal in the fore gut. Rumination or fore gut fermentation is typified by the set artiodactyls, the even toed ungulates, such as camels, giraffes, hippopotamuses, pronghorn antelope, the cervids, which are your deer, the bovids, uh, your cows and bison, as well as kangaroos, koalas, sloths, lemurs, proboscis monkeys, and colobus monkeys, including this species here, the mantled guariza, which is a type of colobus monkey and a very efficient foregut fermenter. Four gut fermenters possess a complex and multi-chambered stomach with cellulose digesting microorganisms. So after food is procured by cropping or grazing, it passes down the esophagus and into the first and largest chamber in the network, the rumen. The rumen, of course, is the namesake for the ruminant herbivores. Within the rumen, the food is going to be moistened and kneaded, and thereby it's going to thoroughly mix that plant material with the symbiotic microorganisms living in the rumen, and they're going to ferment that food. Large particles of the food is going to float to the top of the rumen fluid and then it's going to pass into this second chamber here called the reticulum. This is a blind end chamber meaning there's no exit down here and it's characterized by the honeycomb partitioning in its walls. So the reticulum is where a softened mass called the cud, C-U-D, the cud is formed. Fermentation is going to occur in both the rumen as well as the honeycombed reticulum and both absorb the main products of fermentation which are short-chained fatty acids. When the ruminant herbivore like the deer or the bighorn sheep is at rest, the softened mass within the reticulum is going to be regurgitated. It's going to go back up the esophagus and then it's going to allow that animal to chew its cud. It's going to ruminate that mass which is going to further break it down by that potent enzyme salivary amylase. The food, this time the cud, is then swallowed a second time as indicated by this black line here and it's going to end up in the third chamber of the network, the omasum. The omasum has uh, muscular walls and it's going to knead that uh, bolus even further. The fourth and final chamber we're going to go through here and end up in the abomasum. This is the true stomach uh, in the ruminant herbivores. This is where digestive enzymes are going to kill any of the escaping microorganisms um, and protein digestion is completed with the enzyme protease. Digested material is then going to move into the small intestine. We remember the first section of the small intestine is called the duodenum. Uh, within the small intestine, uh, products of microbial digestion uh, 
are absorbed and uh, additional fermentation and absorption can occur in the cecum downstream which is at the junction of the small and the large intestine. Here is a, a great uh, close-up of a massive Cape Buffalo which is chewing its cud with that side to side jaw motion. Hind gut fermentation has just one gastric chamber. There's no rumen with the hind gut fermenters. Um, this is characterized by horses zebras, tapirs, rhinoceroses, howler monkeys, elephants, lagomorphs, hyraxes, rodents, as well as some arboreal marsupials. Hindgut fermenters masticate food as they eat. They're going to chew up their food, initiating digestion with salivary enzymes, like salivary amylase. Digestion continues by enzymatic activity in the stomach. Okay, so we're going to go down the esophagus and directly into the simple stomach. And then food is going to move into this long, small intestine as new food is eaten. So unlike the ruminant set artiodactyls, hindgut fermenters, they're not going to regurgitate their food. They're not going to chew their cud. So uh, horses and elephants do not have a rumen and a reticulum and they do not regurgitate their food and chew their cud. Of course, nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, and then finely ground particles of food are going to pass from the small intestine first into the cecum. And larger food particles are going to move right past the cecum and into the large intestine and are eventually passed as feces. So this is important. Among the hind gut fermenters, the colon, the large intestine, is the principal fermentation chamber for larger species like elephants as well as horses. While the cecum is going to be the primary fermentation chamber for smaller species like your rodents and your lagomorphs. But again, hind gut fermentation is meaning that the fermentation is occurring at the end of the alimentary canal instead of at the fore, at the beginning, as in foregut fermentation. So foregut versus hind gut fermentation. The two types of fermentation processes that take place in herbivores have clear advantages as well as disadvantages disadvantages. Foregut fermentation tends to be very efficient because microorganisms begin to break down the plant material before it reaches the small intestine where absorption occurs. Additionally, in foregut fermenters, in ruminants, the microorganisms from the rumen are themselves broken down by acids in the true stomach, the abomasum. The resulting material, which then contains the carbohydrates and the proteins synthesized by those microorganisms, as well as the products of fermentation, are going to move into the intestines and the colon. Another benefit of foregut fermentation is the microorganisms in the rumen are going to detoxify many of those harmful alkaloids in the plants that foregut fermenters consume. In contrast, Food passes rapidly into the small intestine in the hindgut fermenters and is then mixed with the microorganisms downstream in the cecum. 
These animals do not digest the microorganisms themselves that are present in the cecum, and thus they can exploit this potential source of nutrients. In addition, hindgut fermenters must absorb the toxic plant chemicals into the bloodstream and then transport those toxins to the liver for detoxification or sequestration. Efficiency may indeed be the trademark of foregut fermenters of the ruminants However, the hindgut fermenters are able to process material much more rapidly. So, for example, food moves through the gut of a horse in only about 30 to 45 hours, whereas it may take a cow, a ruminant, 70 to 100 hours to process its food. Hind gut fermenters efficiently digest food high in protein because large volumes of food can be passed through them quite rapidly. Furthermore, hind gut fermentation is effective when forage is dominated by indigestible materials such as silica and resins because, again, those compounds are going to move quickly through their alimentary canals by bypassing the cecum, going right into the large intestine, and then excreted. In sum, Due to their lowered efficiency, hindgut fermenters must eat large volumes of food in a short amount of time. The foregut system is relatively slow because food can't pass out of the rumen until it has been ground up into very fine particles. The digestive physiology of herbivores is going to influence both their ecology and their distribution in a myriad of ways. So ruminants, like we see here on the left, they're going to benefit most from foods that require optimal efficiency in the digestive system. Remember, ruminants with their uh, multi-chambered stomach are far better at extracting nutrients from plants. Whereas the best forage for hindgut fermenters, as seen here on the right, is the forage which facilitates speed of digestion. So each strategy has its advantages for survival in particular ecological niches. For environments where um, food is limited, but of relatively high quality, like the Arctic tundra, this is going to favor ruminants, such as the musk ox and caribou. Um, so they're going to have an advantage because they can efficiently extract so many nutrients from that limited amount of forage. But when food is of low quality, with high fiber content, uh, like these dried out grasses here, um, but the food is not limited at all in terms of quantity, a premium is then placed on those species uh, that have the ability to process large amounts of food uh, quickly. So perissodactyls can survive in regions typified by seasonal drought and poor quality food. Places where ruminants are not going to be able to process foods fast enough to survive. So in short, ruminants have the advantage when there is limited high quality forage um, because they have efficient foregut fermentation. Hindgut fermenters, like the rhinoceros here, have the advantage when there is abundant low quality forage um, because they can process so much food so quickly. 
One of the most successful groups of herbivores are the gnawing mammals, namely the rodents and the legomorphs. Like the ungulates, rodents and legomorphs cannot produce the enzyme cellulase, so they are reliant upon fermentation of fibrous forage with the aid of bacteria and protozoa. They have to have those microorganisms in their guts. As with the perissodactyls, rodents and legomorphs do not ruminate. They don't have a rumen, they don't chew their cud. Um, hind gut fermentation in the rodents and legomorphs is going to occur primarily in the cecum as well as the colon. Within the diverse order Rodentia, variation in the morphology of digestive systems is correlated with diet. So for example, squirrels, chipmunks, and marmots, they feed on a wide variety of seeds, nuts, fruits, and herbs, and therefore they have a much simpler digestive system than grass-eating voles and lemmings as pictured here do. Hamsters, pocket gophers, pocket mice, and squirrels have cheek pouches that open near the angle of the mouth. So cheek pouches are well adapted for carrying food. Uh, as an example cited in your book, uh, Allen in 1938 reported 32 beech nuts found in the cheek pouches of an eastern chipmunk, which is the species you see here. We now understand that the digestion of cellulose in hindgut fermenters, species with no rumen like the rodents and the legomorphs, occurs in the cecum. Because there is no regurgitation and because these mammals uh, are going to pass their forage through their alimentary canals so quickly, these mammals can't really process fiber when they first ingest plants. Their microbial communities simply haven't been established yet. As a result, we observe coprophagy, or the feeding on feces. It's evolved in the rabbits and the hares, the legomorphs, rodents, shrews, and some marsupials. Remember, the cecum is located downstream of the small intestine, the principal organ of absorption. So, uh, all of those minerals and vitamins like essential B vitamins that are produced by the fermentation in the cecum, uh, those are otherwise uh, lost uh, to the legomorphs. Uh, they're excreted here. So what that means is the legomorphs are going to consume some of their own feces to uh, allow it to pass through the gut a second time. To optimize the uptake of essential vitamins and minerals and to enhance the assimilation of energy, the legomorphs are going to produce two types of feces. The first are moist, mucus-coated black cecal pellets excreted um, and promptly eaten by the rabbit directly from its own anus, as shown in the diagram. These uh, pellets, these cecal pellets, are stored in the stomach and then they're mixed with the new food um, and uh, they're going to form this alimentary mass. The second uh, type of feces are hard, round feces that are passed normally. So the frequency of coprophagy in rabbits, uh, they're going to do this usually twice daily. And we see that when we prevent coprophagy in laboratory rats, it resulted in a 15 to 25% reduction in growth. Um, so acquiring those nutrients produced in the cecum uh, by consuming uh, their own feces is really important uh, for the growth and survival of these organisms. All right, next we're going to do a quick survey of some of the specialists 
civilizations that we see in herbivores. And we'll start with granivory. So herbivorous mammals that consume primarily fruits, nuts, and seeds are referred to as granivorous, meaning seed eating. So they're typically equipped with large external fur-lined cheek pouches, a keen sense of smell, uh, as in the heteromyid rodents, the kangaroo rats, the kangaroo mice, and the pocket mice. They're going to represent really the most specialized seed eaters. So the diversity and the availability of seeds in desert ecosystems, like our own Sonoran Desert, is really key to the evolutionary success of these heteromyids, the kangaroo rats and mice. In terms of the biomass of seeds they harvest, heteromyids are really rivaled only by ants in terms of being the most important granivores inhabiting North American deserts. So rodents are reported to use over 75% of all seeds produced at certain Mojave and Chihuahuan desert sites. As a result of all those abundant seed resources, as well as competition with those ants and birds and other rodents, the heteromyids, those kangaroo rats and mice, they've evolved fascinating morphological and behavioral adaptations to optimize their foraging success. So they employ large cheek pouches to collect as many seeds as possible in single foraging bouts and then all of these heteromyids are going to cache their seeds. They're going to collect large quantities of seeds and they're going to store them in larders within their burrows or scatter and hoard them in small buried caches uh, outside of their burrow all around their territory. So this is a photograph of a kangaroo uh, rat larder. This is its cache where it's storing all of those seeds for a rainy day. Animals that exhibit adaptations for consuming leaves, stems, buds, and other green portions of plants are referred to as folivorous, meaning the leaf eaters. Only about 4% of mammals specialize in the consumption of leaves and stems. Like grazing and browsing mentioned earlier, consuming leaves and stems requires considerable morphological adjustment in dentition, jaw musculature, and of course gut morphology. Leaves are difficult to digest and they have poor nutritional value. And in response to predation of leaves by herbivores, many of these plants have evolved diverse chemical defenses like toxic phenols and terpenes. In spite of these obstacles, three species of marsupials subsist on seemingly unpalatable leaves of eucalyptus trees, koalas uh, pictured here, as well as the greater gliders and the common ring-tailed possums in eastern Australia. Folivory is represented in about 12% of the primate genera. Within this group, uh, notable folivores include the Indries, the howler monkeys, the langurs, uh, of course the gorillas pictured here, the colobus and leaf monkeys of Africa and Asia. The diet of gorillas, actually the largest of all primates, is going to consist of about 80 six percent leaves shoots and stems and then lastly on the bottom right we have the two and three toed sloths of South America that feed almost exclusively on leaves stems and fruit and let us not forget the giant panda who is well known for its consumption of bamboo shoots so the carnassial teeth of pandas are well adapted for crushing and slicing up fibrous plants. 
But because bamboo is so low in nutritional value, giant pandas are going to spend about 12 hours a day consuming up to 40 kilograms. That's over 80 pounds of bamboo. And yet, they're going to digest less than 20% of what they eat. Much of the stem is passed through the gut relatively unchanged. Mammals that exhibit adaptations to consume a diet of fruit, which of course is the reproductive part of uh, the flowering plants, are referred to as frugivorous, meaning the fruit-eating mammals. So mammals from several families are known to specialize in the consumption of fruit. The old world fruit bats or the flying foxes as pictured here, as well as the new world leaf nosed bats. The cuscusses and brush tail possums, uh, which we covered already, tree shrews, uh, primates such as lemurs, lorises, many old world monkeys, colobus monkeys, as well as our closest cousins, the chimpanzees and bonobos. As fruit can have a hard outer covering, the teeth of some of these frugivores are adapted for piercing and crushing uh, through that uh, skin of the fruit. Insects and hummingbirds are not the only animals that have evolved to exploit nectar. In fact, some mammals are also exquisitely adapted to capitalize on this resource to take advantage of high caloric nectar and in the process spread the pollen of the host plant. So nectarivory, meaning nectar-eating mammals, are represented by about six genera of bats as well as the marsupial honey possums. Their skulls are characterized by elongated snouts, small weak teeth, poorly developed jaw musculature. However, their tongues are long and slender and protrude as shown here to access that high caloric nectar and they typically have a brush tip and then they have many rows of these hair like papillae pointed back towards the throat as shown here. Shockingly, there are even some mammals that consume primarily the exudes of trees, such as resins, sap, or gums, and they're termed uh, gumivorous meaning gum-eating mammals. So this peculiar diet uh, occurs in eight species of marmosets, the bush babies, the patos, the slow lorises, four species of the pedaurid gliders, the wrist-winged gliders, marsupial gliders, as well as the lead betters possum. All members of the dwarf and mouse lemurs are going to feed on tree exudes. So the diet of the uh, fork marked mouse lemur of Madagascar, pictured here, consists of close to 90%. Its diet is 90% gum from the trunks and branches of trees. Animals that consume fungi, mushrooms and such, are referred to as mycophagus, meaning fungus eating. So it's noteworthy that about 22 species of primates consume fungi, including marmosets, gorillas, bonobos, macaques, vervet monkeys, manga bees, and this guy, the snub-nosed monkey, whose diet is actually composed of 95% mushrooms. So fleshy fungi are about 70 to 90% water, but they do provide a great source of protein and phosphorus to the consumer. And then below ground, those sporocarps are reported to have very high concentrations of nitrogen, vitamins, and other minerals. The vast majority of mammals are omnivorous, meaning everything eating. I certainly feel that way. Um, and mammals are notably opportunistic. 
So each order of mammals contains omnivorous species. However, omnivory is best illustrated in the opossums, the primates, including you and I, the humans, uh, pigs, bears, like this sun bear here, as well as raccoons. The dentition of omnivores is versatile. It's adapted to process a variety of foods, as you would expect. Omnivorous mammals are going to retain uh, piercing and ripping cusps in the anterior teeth, but typically have flat, broad cheek teeth with bunodont cusps that are adapted for crushing food. The stomachs of omnivores, such as pigs, are comparatively simple. The cecum of most omnivores is, is poorly developed due to the lack of fibrous plant material in the diet. Phew! 58 slides. I believe that is a uh, new record uh, for us. Uh, pat yourselves on the back. Round of applause. You've done it. Um, I hope you enjoyed all of the beautiful pictures, and I promise you our last lecture for the week is considerably shorter. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers.